Welcome to Developmental Psychology Unit 1. In this unit, we're going to be talking about all things developmental methods. And so what we're going to start off with is first talking about why do we have developmental psychology? What is the purpose of this anyway? Well, lots of people are interested in developmental psychology because they want to learn more about kids or babies or teenagers because maybe they're going to work in education or social work or maybe they're going to be parents someday. Maybe they want to have own, their own insight into their own life and why they are the way they are. But in terms of an academic discipline, we actually find there's some advantages to this area of psychology over other areas. One of the big advantages is that this is an area that studies very vulnerable groups. Infants, kids, as well as elders, very vulnerable groups that need protection and allows us to have insight to this group so we can better implement policies to help them. Especially when we're talking about the early parts of the lifespan, this can help us to be preventative. It's much easier to be proactive than to be reactive. So being able to see the predecessors to a mental health illness or a catastrophe and help us to prevent that can really help be cost effective in society. In fact, researchers have found that for every dollar spent in early childhood education, we save $8 as a government in terms of social work, in terms of criminal justice, in terms of healthcare, and in terms of later on education. So we know this is good stuff. And finally, as compared to other areas in psychology, development is extremely holistic. In order to be a developmental psychologist, you really have to keep your toes in the water in what is happening in social, cognitive, neuroscience, emotional, all the different areas of psychology. So because of that, it's important to understand that the domains we look at are broad. Almost every developmental milestone has a physical, cognitive, social, and emotional component to it. If we think about when babies start to walk or when babies start to bond with others, everything is overlaid. If you think about a child who starts to read a book, that is a huge cognitive milestone. But also they have to be able to have the dexterity to hold the book. They have to have had some sort of emotional bond in reading books in the past, and it has to bring them some sort of enjoyment. Almost everything we talk about in terms of developed milestones could tap into one of these four, if not all of these domains. Even though I'll teach this course in a segmented way, while having you know physical development, cognitive development, emotional development, social development, it's more to understand that all four of these domains constantly overlap. Now it's important to understand in developmental psychology that we tend to talk about different stages and different milestones, but there's been disagreement about exactly what these stages are in different cultures and over different points in time. If we were to go back thousands of years and around the globe, there would be almost no agreement in what the different developmental stages are. If we stay just here in Canada and go back roughly 120 years, we actually find there's a huge difference in what they consider the developmental stages to be. In fact, pre-1900s, we really had two stages in development, babies and everyone else. And so babies were someone who couldn't walk, couldn't talk, and needed a diaper, and everyone else was everyone else. So where does a five-year-old kid land? Well, a five-year-old kid can wear a hard helmet, carry a lunchbox, and hold a tool belt. So five-year-old kids can have jobs in coal mines, and they did. It was very common that kids would start carrying lunchboxes around age five, age six, and they would go to work. People at that point in time didn't understand how children and adults were qualitatively different in terms of their emotion regulation, in terms of their cognitive capacities, in terms of how they felt about themselves, and they were much smaller physically. They would often drastically injure themselves on the job. They're more prone to getting lung cancer, working in the coal mines. Um, yet then we just sent kids to factories or we made them do really intensive work in the homes. So we really didn't understand children were a unique developmental time period. Luckily with the industrial revolution, we started to realize this. And because the work became more machine-like and much more efficient, we didn't need kids in the workforce anymore. So kids had the luxury of going to elementary school. So this is when we started to see more and more kids getting access to an elementary knowledge. And so it started to go to school until about grade six. So this is when we had three kind of cohorts. We had babies, kids, and adults. And those were really the three main developmental groups. It wasn't until after World War II that our economy shifted again and work became even more efficient to the point we didn't need to have adolescents in the workforce. So adolescents now existed. Now people didn't have to go to the workforce until they were 18. They could go and get secondary school, which previously was something only the very wealthy and affluent could access. 
So it's the idea now they could go to high school. Now in the 1950s, we have things like people hanging out at soda shops and relaxing and having leisure and all this new type of adolescent exploration. As we move on to the 1970s and 1980s, we start to realize that there was even more groups we should have been paying attention to. For one, there's a group between babies and children. There's this fascinating group called toddlers where they can walk and they can talk, but they definitely don't have the same abilities as a kid. And there's also a group called the senior citizens. As life expectancy started to grow in Canada, people were not dying as much in their 50s and 60s, they could live beyond 65 years of age, and we could understand, oh, there's this whole other segment that's not just pre-death anymore. It could be at the period of thriving and fulfillment and meaning, and that's what our golden years were all about. The last stage we really discovered in the 1990s called emerging adulthood. So emerging adulthood was coined by Dr. Arnett in the 1990s as post-secondary education became more popular and as people went to college and university, they didn't quite feel like teenagers anymore, but they definitely didn't feel like adults. They had some independence, but not all independence. They definitely were not uh, as responsible for as many finances as your typical adult. And so emergent adulthood became its own unique stage in development. And so this is the idea that there's their own sort of idea of how they're problem solving, how they're thinking about the world. So these are the seven main stages that I prefer for people to know. Babies, toddlers, children, teens, emerging adults, adults, and now says seniors, we tend to call people over age 65 elders. So the, the ages I have written here are just kind of rough estimates, especially for emerging adulthood. Some people might find they are only in emerging adulthood until they're 22 or until they're 30 or what have you. But then we could subdivide some of these stages. Some people choose to subdivide children into early, middle, and late childhood, or adolescence into preteens, early adolescence, and late teens. And adulthood sometimes gets divided into early, middle, and late adulthood. You don't need to know what's on the next slide, but just for your own interest, I've seen upwards of this many divisions of development. So we can see here babies, toddlers, early childhood, male childhood, late childhood, preteens, early adolescence, late adolescence, emerging adulthood, young adulthood, middle aged adults, where I sadly am now at the age of 37. How did that happen? Older adults and elders. And so not all researchers agree on these cutoff points. These are rough estimates, but it's to give you an idea of how we talk about our developmental trajectories.